Okay, it's time to round up today's top stories in the world of science and tech with CTV science and technology expert Dan Riskin. Good thing we turn to you for these stories, Dan. <laughs> well, I guess I got the title. I better right. live up to it. Yeah, how appropriate. Okay, let's talk about the Amazon. Uh, I'm smiling, but this is pretty serious. It's drawing closer there to a tipping point of no return. Real concern now. Yeah, so some data coming out of the Amazon right now show that as disturbance happen, like fires or clear cuts, the Amazon's a little bit slower to recover than it was before, almost like an injured person whose immune system isn't quite working that well. And the Amazon is resilient. It can fight back. But there is this tipping point that ecologists warn about where if you cut down too much of it, it no longer pumps so much water up into the sky every time it rains. And once it ceases to do that, there's less rain overall, and that's going to dry the whole thing out. So you can't have a miniature version of the Amazon rainforest. You can't save a third of it and expect it to continue to function because once it gets small beyond a certain certain uh, point, that tipping point, it no longer functions as a rainforest. So a, a dire warning and uh, just a reminder to everybody that climate change is the real deal and we need to protect the Amazon. Yeah, absolutely. That's a fascinating study, Dan. Um, let's move to something else here. A 10-minute visit from a therapy dog can help reduce your pain while you're waiting in the hospital's ER. Another reason why dogs are just so fantastic. Absolutely. And maybe we need, you know, therapy dogs when we're talking about the Amazon, too, yeah, because no kidding, that can right? be pretty hard. But, yeah. you know, you go into ER, you know, you've got an injury of some kind, you're in pain, you're anxious, you're stressed, you're perhaps even depressed if you're there for mental health reasons, uh, or maybe that's just a side effect of what you're going through. And a study in Saskatchewan, they brought therapy dogs in to the emergency room and people pet the dog for 10 minutes and it had a huge effect. Not only did people feel less stressed, not only did people feel improvements in their depression, but people felt less pain, significantly less pain. Now, if you're hurt and you're in the emergency room and all it takes is petting a dog for 10 minutes to bring down those symptoms, uh, that's something we should be exploring because, you know, dogs are a human's best friend and they have this gift and maybe we're not taking full advantage of it the way we should. Yeah, I mean, it's some sort of different disasters or, you know, just awful stories that I've covered. The therapy dogs, uh, you know, I've seen the people bring them out and they really do help. And this, this study just sort of backs that up even more, Dan. Uh, yeah. Finally, uh, you may want to be petting a dog as you consider this next story as well, because arachnophobes, <laughs> well, you're not going to like this story at all. Yeah, it's a spider the size of a dog. Yeah, it's, it's well, fit. it's not quite it's the fit. size of a dog. Yeah. It, so these things are called Joro spiders and they're, they've been taken off like crazy. Uh, they're, they come from Japan. Uh, in other parts of Asia, but they've moved to Georgia in the States, and a new paper suggests that their success there is a harbinger of things to come. These spiders are, I mean, they're beautiful to look at on TV, but they're big. I mean, uh, the spider is about the size of the palm of your hand, not the, not your fingers, just the palm. It's several inches in, in uh, length with the legs. And this new model suggests that these things could spread all across the East Coast. The good news for Canada, though, is winters seem to work it over. It can handle a brief freeze, but it can't handle a Canadian winter. So we shouldn't have these things in Toronto, but nonetheless, it may affect our plans to visit Florida and other places in the States. Okay, yeah, a spider the size of the palm of my hand, that's, that's a concern, Dan, no doubt about that. Yeah. But again, thank goodness for winter. And thanks for Dan Risk and being <laughs> here as well. Great to see you, Dan, we'll see you next week. Have a good one. Thanks a lot, you too. And a new poll out from Ameripublic Public Opinion finds that a sizable majority of Americans are supporting U.S. President Joe Biden's decision to ban Russian oil imports, and more Americans would support a restart to the Keystone XL pipeline project. John Wright, the executive vice president at Ameripublic Public Opinion, joins us now live with more of the findings of this latest poll. Good morning, John. Thanks so much for this. Um, it's really fascinating here. You know, one of the first things Joe Biden did as president was cancel Keystone XL. Now it seems, according to your polling, a majority of Americans would like him to reverse that decision. How do you interpret that? Well, a couple of ways. Number one is that when faced with losing 8% of the energy um, um, that has been shipped in from Russia, and secondly, with the high price of gas uh, in the United States, there's certainly uh, you know, Americans looking to other sources to fill the gap. So it's, it's primarily a bipartisan approach to this, where both Democrats and Republicans are in favor. And secondly, it really does reverse what uh, President Biden brought in to uh, satisfy Democratic side of the vote. So it's a good boost, but the question is whether or not we'll be able to fulfill it. And that's a, a real problem right now, because the company that put the billions of dollars behind the Keystone Pipeline, in fact, withdrew it because of protests. Right now, uh, workers want to get back to work, and Americans want prices down, and they want Canadian oil. And it's interesting, John, you know, when it comes to polling, and you've been doing this for decades, when you see that kind of bipartisan agreement on an issue in a country as divided as the U.S., maybe just even over the last several years, how rare is it to see so many Americans on the same side of an issue? 
Well, it's very rare. I mean, you don't get this kind of uh, bipartisan agglomerate who want something done for the country. But these are unprecedented times. I mean, uh, it's not just what we're seeing on television in terms of, you know, what's going on in Ukraine and the response to that where 82 percent of Americans stand shoulder to shoulder with Joe Biden. But just as you're showing right now, the amount of uh, price that's at the uh, at the gas station, Americans believe that this is something which, in fact, would help bring that price down. So uh, it's going to be difficult to have the pipeline built. Um, the real short-term uh, issue is producing about 200,000 barrels a day, but getting it to the United States where there's going to have to be increased capacity on rail in order to do that. So mm -hmm. uh, when you look across the country on the polling, it, there's a lot of support for that right now. You know, what I also found interesting about this, John, is the fact that Americans, you know, chose Canada first in terms of a replacement to that oil. Uh, some people may suggest that Americans are, are unaware of Canada's actual ability or at least, you know, reserves of oil available. Uh, but Americans seem to look to Canada first. Do you have any in insight as to why that is, why they look to Canada before other, you know, the more traditional oil producing countries that we talk about internationally? Yeah, I, th I think a lot of it just has to do with affinity. I mean, when you're cho uh, faced with a choice of Saudi Arabian oil, Venezuelan oil, Oil and Mexican oil, the gravity of the of the United States tilts north and looks to Canada. I think there's again there's a, a great affinity and respect for Canada. Um, not a lot of Americans are tuned into what the issues were, and we have to say there are very controversial issues around the pipeline being built. But yesterday there was a press conference held by workers in America uh, who who had worked on the pipeline that want to get back to work. This is a, a time when that voice, in fact, can resonate and bring Canada into the picture. It's interesting, John, too. You know, there's a whole idea of, like, clean or corrupt oil or dirty oil, depending on yep. where it comes from. I suppose Canada would very, very much be seen as a much more... Um, you know, satisfying uh, source of oil, considering all the politics and environmentalism comes around uh, oil production. I think there's a view of Canada being a pristine country. I mean, it's almost like tourism. When you kind of look to where you want to go and what we have here, it's the world next door in terms of the kind of people that Americans see. Um, the reality is that when you trade that off against Venezuelan oil, against Mexican oil and Saudi Arabian oil, you get a, a sense that uh, that Canada being closer would be able to supply the oil quicker. Well, that's probably not the case, except in a short term, about 200,000 barrels a day, as I said. But, but Americans now are looking to the gas prices at their pumps. They have to replace 8% of their entire energy because it's been banned from coming into the United States. The affinity for Canada being closer, in fact, probably plays into that. Mm -hmm. um, but we're going to have to uh, sort that out over the next you know, um, year. It's not just going to take uh, you know, days to do this. So uh, what it does, though, is open the political capital for Joe Biden because right. these are uh, numbers that he could use. Yeah, that's pretty significant indeed. Always interesting to get that sort of political pulse of the nation. John Wright, thanks for joining us with your insights again this morning. Thanks for the time. It's my pleasure, Nick. Take care. Spring officially arrives Sunday, and tech, it's a great way to welcome in the new season. Joining me now to talk new gadgets for spring, everything from robot lawnmowers to smart air purifiers, I'm joined live by tech expert Mark Salzman. Morning, Mark. Good morning, George. Great to chat with you. Always good to have you on the show. So let's start with something practical and healthy. <laughs> sure. So spring often marks the start of allergy season for many. So air purifiers are a popular purchase. And 3M has their fill treat smart air purifier. What does it mean smart? Well, it's got a laser-based sensor that reads particles in the air like pollen, that's my nemesis, dust, pet dander, and more. It continuously monitors the air quality, and it also has this auto mode that adjusts for span, uh, fan speed on the fly, so you don't have to do anything. But there is an app that lets you control it from anywhere and see information like in graphs. You can use your voice with a smart speaker to say something like, ask Phil Treat for the air quality and you're gonna get that kind of information. So again, becoming very smart, 349 for the medium version, 399 for the large fill treat there. And then when you leave your home, you wanna bring a lightweight laptop with you. This is the Asus Chromebook Flip CM3. It's a ultra lightweight laptop that's only 1.1 kilograms, so super portable, and lets you bring it to you know a coffee shop, to a park bench, to the office, and you can leave the charger at home because it has a battery that lasts up to 16 hours. 
And as you can see, it's on a 360 degree hinge. So it's a laptop, it's a tablet, and it supports other modes. And Chromebooks have built in virus protection, a huge app store, uh, instant startup times. And the price is great, only $4.99 for that Chromebook. Oh, great. Well, let's keep pulling on that uh, portability thread. What's new and exciting with projectors? Yeah, so portability is the operative word. The Samsung Freestyle just debuted last month, uh, last week rather. This is an ultra portable and compact projector with a 180 degree cradle stand. What that means is you can project your favorite content on a variety of angles and surfaces. So it could be walls, uh, indoors or outdoors, by the way, on the side of a tent, uh, even on the ceiling. Imagine a, a few kids lying on their bed looking up at a 100 inch image uh, to watch a movie. Uh, there's no focus wheel and automatically adjust the picture quality has built in speaker, built in apps, uh, support and, and more. It's 1149 for the Samsung Freestyle. And speaking of streaming content, Roku announced that they're the number one TV streaming platform in Canada. They have these inexpensive uh, sticks, you know, $65 for the Roku streaming stick plus uh, the 4K model that is, just plugs into a TV, lets you access all your favorite uh, free channels as well as subscribe Subscription services like Crave or what have you, you can sign into Bell 5 and watch it on a non smart TV because this is what has the Wi Fi and stronger Wi Fi at that with mm -hmm. uh, twice the speeds now. Good stuff, only 65 bucks for that Roku. Great, Mark. And let's wrap up with something for fans who feel the need for speed and at a robot that'll chip in with the yard work. Sure. So first, Gran Turismo 7 just came out for the PS4 and PS5. This is the latest in the best-selling car racing franchise that has sold 80 million units since it debuted a quarter of a century ago. So Sunday doesn't just mark the start of spring, but also the beginning of the F1 season. You can also race NASCARs here. Uh, there's over 400 cars in total, over 90 tracks. There's dynamic weather. That is not real. That is photorealistic graphics right there. $79 for the PS4 version, $89 for the PS5. And then finally, yes, a robotic lawnmower. This is amazing. The Husqvarna 430X automower uses three razor sharp blades to quietly and autonomously cut your grass while you watch on maybe sitting in your favorite Muskoka chair. There it is right there. And those tiny clippings are recycled into the turf as a natural fertilizer to make your lawn look lush it looks awesome it's safe by the way you, when you lift it up those blades stop uh, rotating oh, good. you can use an app you can use a smart speaker uh, it'll know where to go with its gps uh, navigation and guide wires so great stuff 31.99 from Husqvarna. that's the 430x model uh really good stuff cool. mark salsman you, you always bring it and then you give it away so we're going to give <laughs> it away two copies of the gran turismo 7 game here's the question for our viewers out there right now how many copies of the Gran Turismo franchise over the 25 years have been sold to date? Mark mentioned it. Just go to contest at cp24.com. Give us your name, address, and phone number, and your chance to win. Real quick, Mark, where do people reach out to read, hear, and watch more about Mark Salzman? Yeah, sure. So uh, social media is the best. Uh, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube. Awesome. Thanks so much, George. Have a Thank great you, day. Mark. You have a great day and the rest of spring break. Well, the St. Patrick's Day Parade is finally making its return this Sunday, and we'll have extensive coverage of one of the city's largest events. Joining us now for a sneak peek of the festivities is the chair of the St. Patrick's Day Parade Society of Toronto, Sean Ruddy. Sean, good morning to you. Tell us where you are. Oh, good morning. I'm down at Exhibition Place in uh, right in the heart of the city, and we're getting our floats ready, enjoying... Uh, a nice day, a balmy day. It's going to be nice on Sunday, so the floats are going to be, they're weatherproof, so it doesn't matter if it rains. We're going to be there. Oh, okay, that's cool. I didn't know that the floats could be weatherproof, but that's uh, some good assurance there. So oh. tell us, Sean, when was the last day or the last time we had a St. Patrick's Day parade? It's been some time, it was, right? It's been a couple years. It was 2019. Okay. And, and that was the last year we pulled the plug on that one. Right. So what can people expect from the parade this year. This is going to be exciting. It's the first live event, major live event in the city, in person. And I hear that masks are not required, correct? Masks are not required. That's, uh, unless it's uh, city employees, they may be required because they're marching in uniforms, maybe the Toronto Fire. But having said that, the Toronto Fire will be busy 
collecting for our food bank, Daily Bread Food Bank. So we're asking people to support that initiative. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the city's looking good. We're open for business. The city's alive. St. Patrick's, no better way to bring the people out than through that event. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, th I think Sunday is going to be pretty nice temperature as well, sunny and bright. Not as warm as today, but pretty good. So take us along. What's what's the path? What's the route of the parade this year? The route is at St. George and Bloor at 12 o'clock on Sunday, March 20th. And then after we uh, get that started, we head over to Young Street. And from mm -hmm. Young Street, we head south on Young to Queen. And then we head past Nathan Phillips Square. All right. So mm -hmm. okay, three and a half a... kilometers long. Huh. That's pretty good. That's a workout. Uh, Sean, I will be hosting this parade on Sunday along with Hugo. Is he a cool guy? <laughs> Hugo is the voice of the community, and it's a voice that one day we may miss. I'll tell you, Hugo's a great guy, and he's a strong supporter of everything Irish and everything in our city. So we're, we're happy to have Hugo up there doing what he's got to do, and we're happy to have you as our host. Yay. I'm so excited for this. I'm really, uh, I've got my outfit picked out. It's going to be green. Uh, <laughs> spoiler alert there. Uh, uh, well, good. <laughs> exactly. So, Sean, tell us about if people want to participate in the parade. Are they watching along the route of the parade, or can they actually join into the actual march of it? Well, What's... so what we do is we have a, a number. We have 80 entries in the parade with 10, 12 marching bands. We have a lot of community entries that have already been uh, registered and prior. We tell people they can participate by showing up on the day, get on the parade route, somewhere along that three and a half kilometer stretch enjoy the day support the restaurants go out make let's make a day of it and put a little bit of our past in behind us for the one day and get on get toronto open the city needs this mm -hmm. um we want to be a part of this and we want to open this city up to all the bars restaurants hotels and i think we're doing a good job yeah i think so and you know this couldn't come at a better time i know that a lot of restaurants are eager to welcome a lot of people back into their their stores and this parade is definitely going to drive that so uh, i will be there sunday i will see you there hopefully and i will see sean there and i know that some uh, toronto dignitaries are going to be there including mayor john tory so just a reminder for our viewers at home if you're not going to be out there in person tune into cp24 Live Sunday, March 20th, starting at noon for full coverage of the St. Patrick's Day Parade. In the meantime, Sean Ruddy, chair of the St. Patrick's Parade Society of Toronto. Happy St. Patrick's Day to you, and thanks for joining us, joining us on CP24 Breakfast today. Have a good one. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Thank you. Cheers. Okay, to you, Bill. Thank you. We're looking at Temple Bar, which is right along the Lafay River. Uh, not far of a walk from uh, St. Stephen's Green. It is such a pretty place to be. The weather keeps changing every time we go back there. It was a little dewy and foggy and rainy, and now it's back into the sunshine. Looks like it's a mild day there, though not a lot of layers, and not dissimilar to what we will be seeing today. Now, it's all things Irish. You can practice this one, Jen Erin Gubrach which means mm. Ireland forever. Uh, we've got Mika here with us, and we've got Lisa and Jen. Uh, so we're going to talk a, a few of the fun facts about St. Patrick's Day that you might not actually know. And uh, I'm, you probably heard the story of St. Saint Patrick uh, having notoriety from ridding the Emerald Isle of snakes. I know mm. Mika hates snakes. <laughs> yeah, don't <laughs> but talk snakes. Did you know there's actually no fossil <laughs> record of snakes in Ireland. It's an island and, uh, you know, before modern times, it was covered in ice uh, as, as the plates oh moved. So there were no snakes in Ireland. So it was an allegory for obviously driving out, probably uh, in the religious terms, sin and bringing the, the word of, of, uh, of religion and, and the Lord to, to Ireland. So that was the story. Wow. No snakes. Ooh. Mika, you can open your eyes again. <laughs> <laughs> the rattlesnake oh, okay. tail is gone. That's the second thing I got to ask you is when do you think the first Saint, where and when was the first St. Patrick's Day parade? When do you think? Hmm. It'll probably surprise. I'll narrow it down. It's a state in the U.S. Oh. Oh. Mm -hmm. Pre, pre, uh, Boston? they come together, United States. Mika says Boston. Mm, well, that was one of the Boston? earlier ones for sure. New York and Boston were early, but believe it or not, the first one, and it predates uh, the United States of America, was in Florida, what's now what? known as St. Augustine, Florida, in March 17th, 1601. There's a Spanish colony there, and the Irish vicar Ricardo Artur 
uh, had the wow. first parade. In, I would uh, never have guessed yeah, Florida. I Same. wouldn't have guessed that either, no. doing a little research. Interesting. The next thing is... I would have thought, uh, yeah, I would have thought Chicago, Boston, they, New York. They New were York the City. earlier ones, yes. Yeah. And they continued and they grew bigger from, from those in more modern times. Uh, cabbage, uh, a lot of people uh, liken the foods to be eaten. Uh, cabbage and corned beef. Mm. Uh, but that was actually not an Irish tradition. Mm. It was an Irish-American tradition. And what happened was they would... Uh, in the 19th century and early 20th, uh, they would purchase leftover corned beef from the ships returning from the tea trade uh, from China, and then they would cook it three times, uh, twice just the corned beef, and then the last time with cabbage to remove some of the brine. Oh. Wow. Interesting, right? A lot yeah. of things you didn't know. Yeah. And finally, mm. leprechaun. This one's probably a you little bit know. more obvious. Uh, where do you think the leprechauns come from? Or the idea of leprechauns. Lucky charms. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly yeah. it's like All the chicken and the egg. What came first? Uh, maybe an old folkloric tale? Yeah, a gnome. Yeah, Kel Celtic uh, tradition. Yeah. They believed a in Celtic fairies. Ah. And uh, it's kind of believed that the leprechaun uh, was uh, kind of a, a cranky old, lep old uh, fairy <laughs> that was actually responsible for mending shoes of other fairies. And uh, there's ah. another word uh, that way dates back in, in folklore, loberkin, uh, which means uh, small bodied fellow. And I guess that all came together to be uh, the modern day uh, understanding of leprechaun. Wow. That's oh wow! Pretty cool. Aww. That's fascinating. These facts, Bill. It's oh fun, my god! Right? Do a little bit it's of research, really even fun. on your There's own so culture. Much history. You don't, yeah, you don't. You don't know. So that's one to one to grow yeah. on, right? <laughs> Interesting. What do you have planned for your St. Pat Patrick's Day, Patty's Day uh, celebrations? Yeah. For me? Are you talking to me? Yeah, about? all of you. What, oh. are you. what are you up to? Okay, well, I guess I'll start. Um, you know, they, they, people usually, like, we had a viewer this morning who said they're celebrating with a mimosa, which oh, I was that's... like, oh, that's kind of cool. Get dressed up and drink a mimosa. But since mm -hmm. I just came back from March break, I'm going to take a break on, you know, all things vino and Guinness. Uh, <laughs> and it is actually uh, during Lent, and it's kind of a Catholic mm -hmm. uh, holiday. So I'm going to just, uh, you know, refrain from that today. That's how I'm going to celebrate. Okay. Yeah, what about you, Mika? Well, I'm going to drink some green tea. I put some green nice. on. I don't ah. know if you can see some green. I put some greenery in my background here. <laughs> and I'm going to drink some green tea. We're going to eat some Lucky Charms with my kids. Nice. And, and that's it. Just, you know what? <laughs> Actually, Adrian, we're going to do some art today. So I know Adrian already drew yesterday a leprechaun. So we're going to color that up and just have some fun. Nice. Aww. That's awesome. That's cute. I love that. I, I kind of felt a little bit pot of goldish today, you guys. Uh. But uh, full disclosure, I've actually never had a Guinness myself, so I actually might celebrate today. Uh -huh. I might just try my first Guinness later on today. We'll see. Um, it's a meal. It, yeah, I, so <laughs> like no meal. dinner. That'll be my dinner tonight. <laughs> Guinness. That's, that's my plan. Yeah. Uh, it's great. I think you'll enjoy it. But Jen, you're absolutely right. Uh -huh. During Lent, uh, you know, people often assume the St. Patrick's Day associated with drinking because that's just how we celebrate what I think is the weather's starting to turn. Uh, but if for many, it is a dry celebration and you can do it with uh, the green tea. Sounds delicious. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Or avocado. I have avocado yes. every day. Yes. Yes. Me on the We're just throwing in everything that's green. <laughs> nope. Go for a Broccoli. walk in the park. Find a shamrock. <laughs> All the green. <laughs> Joining us live now with some of the films out this weekend is Richard Krause, host of Pop Life and The Last Call podcast. Richard, great to see you again. Let's get into it. We'll start with this uh, eight-episode series starring Academy Award winners Jared Leto and Anne Hathaway. Tell us about this. Yeah, this is called We Crashed. It's on Apple TV Plus, uh, and it is a look at the We Work phenomenon. I don't know if you remember a few years ago, these We Work places were everywhere where you could essentially rent an office space uh, that uh, meant that you didn't have to pay rent on a permanent location. And they were huge. Uh, after just a, a decade or so, they became a global brand worth about $47 billion. Uh, and and then in less than a year, the bottom fell out and everything fell apart. Uh, and this is uh, the story of all of that. And it kind of follows in the, the line of a lot of these startup dramas that mm -hmm. we've seen lately, like The Dropout and other things like that. Uh, but it has good performances, as you would expect, from Anne Hathaway and Jared Leto. Uh, and uh, it tells a story that I guess is part cautionary tale uh, for anyone who is thinking about starting up a business. Yeah, it kind and of it's reminds called Weed uh -huh. On Apple TV Plus. Nice. It reminds me of uh, the social network. Okay, uh, next up, Richard. Uh, this movie is a coming of age story about a young yeah. Mohawk girl. 
Yeah, I loved this. It's called Beans. It is on Crave right now. Uh, it had a theatrical run earlier in the year. A lot of people saw it that way. Uh, now it can reach an even larger audience. And it's directed by a woman named uh, Tracy Deer, and she has based it in part on her own experience of growing up uh, during the Oka crisis. And we are seeing this uh, very powerful event through the eyes of a 12-year-old girl uh, who is just trying to figure out her way through life and uh, with her family and with everything that's going around her. It is a very powerful story about a young person that's been forced to grow up a little bit too quickly. It's called Beans, and it's on Crave right now. Okay, I'll be checking that one out. Richard, finally, mm -hmm. let's close Close it out with this comedy drama series starring Amy Schumer and the very funny Michael Sarah, who is in Juno. Uh, tell yeah. us about this. This is called Life and Beth. You'll find it on Disney Plus. There are 10 episodes. Uh, and this is Amy Schumer. You know her from Trainwreck and I Feel Pretty and, of course, her stand up. Uh, and she has that kind of life that looks perfect on the outside, but then something happens that causes her to kind of reassess everything and try and figure out how she got to this point in her life where she is. Part of this is done in flashbacks. Uh, and it is essentially someone looking back over their life uh, in. A, you know, a, a funny way with a fair amount of humor, but also with a kind of poignant eye uh, towards the past and looking forward to the future. It's called Life and Beth, and it's on Disney Plus right now. Okay, that looks interesting as well, and it's a series which I really don't think we've yep. seen them do yet in on a, on a streaming service like this. So thank you for those picks. Uh, film critic Richard Krause, host of Pop Life and The Last Call podcast. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Richard. You too. Thanks.